thanks to all the series organizers and to everyone else here for joining us. Uh, what I'm going to share today is very much a work in progress still. Um, as an ethicist, I'm primarily interested in conceptual engineering insofar as it can help make us morally better uh, in both our understanding and our behavior. For there's this really fascinating, complex, uh, never-ending chain of causal feedback loops between the concepts that we possess and use in our thinking, our individual actions and dispositions, and of course, our collective actions and institutions as well. It's only slightly hyperbolic to say, as David Ellerman does, that the basic institutions in a society define the horizons of thought. Uh, but it's no exaggeration to say that the institutions and practices that we have can be so dominant, so common, so enduring, or even so pervasive that we can sometimes take for granted or even fail to notice some of the most fundamental, characteristic, wonderful, or heinous uh, features of those basic institutions and widespread practices. So consider a hopefully familiar example. It was only in the 1970s when people first conceived of sexual harassment as such and coined a term for it. Even though sexually harassing behavior had of course been around for so long and was so common. But once we had the concept of sexual harassment, we were empowered to think differently and behave differently and interact with each other differently. And of course, govern ourselves differently, all of which in turn contributed to further adjustments to our conceptual repertoires over time. So for just one example, without the concept of sexual harassment, I think it's possible we may never have gained the concept of mansplaining. Um, after considering these types of changes, I've come to see conceptual engineering as a way of taking responsibility for key aspects of our shared world. Just like civil or software engineers take responsibility for designing more useful bridges or writing more useful code, conceptual engineers take responsibility for developing more useful resources for thinking. As an ethicist, I want to consider our moral reasons for undertaking conceptual engineering projects and the moral responsibility that I think some conceptual engineers are taking when they do their work. So here's my plan. Uh, we'll start by discussing forward-looking moral responsibility in comparison to the backward-looking kind of responsibility. We'll canvas some paradigm examples, note some commonalities across those cases, and then ask what it is that we can take responsibility for. After which we'll focus on taking moral responsibility specifically for concepts, um, which I'll conclude turns out to be a type of conceptual engineering. And in the last main section, um, we'll examine a case, which is the concept of employment. This will involve sketching one of David Ellerman's arguments um, identifying some moral reasons why we should reconsider the concept of employment. And lastly, a few thoughts about how to take responsibility for that and other concepts. Now, um, most of the philosophical literature on moral responsibility, uh, my own work included, most of it focuses on the backward looking kind of responsibility, something that we attribute to people after the fact. And looking backward in time to assess things that have already happened is certainly important. It's important to identity formation, social cohesion, and all sorts of other things. So I'm not knocking the backward kind of moral responsibility, but it's not my focus today. I wanna attend to forward-looking moral responsibility, which is the future-oriented moral responsibility that we as individuals and collectives actively take on ourselves or sometimes assign to others. And this is our moral responsibility for things that haven't happened yet, that could happen or fail to happen depending on how we exercise our agency 
either individually or collectively. This forward-looking kind of moral responsibility has generally gotten short shrift in the philosophical literature. But there are more important reasons for attending to forward-looking moral responsibility than just to fill a gap in the literature. For one thing, um, ascribing backwards-looking moral responsibility to ourselves or others, insofar as it can lead to blame and or guilt and shame, um, this can sometimes be counterproductive, especially if our goal is to spur moral development or improve material conditions for members of oppressed groups or to repair relationships. For blame and guilt can sometimes cause a sort of psychological paralysis or make people defensively double down on their mistakes or avoid thinking about or sort of dissociate from their past or cause folks to focus on themselves rather than on those to whom they owe apology, restitution, or other sorts of amends. In contrast, taking or assigning forward-looking moral responsibility is often absolutely essential for the achievement of our goals. Iris Marion Young and another um, article by Derek Darby and Nyla Branscombe are good places to consult if you want more defense of these points. Um, Plus, backwards-looking moral responsibility is generally thought of as attaching to individuals. And one of many reasons for this is that our legal systems are designed to focus on identifying the one legally responsible party that can be punished um, after a crime is committed. And then this tends to absolve all the other people who weren't determined to be the one responsible. Um, but I think that responsibility is nearly always shared to some degree, often more than we recognize, uh, whether we like to admit it or not. And insofar as people consciously or unconsciously recognize the shared, diffuse nature of responsibility, they're often reluctant to accept the backward-looking kind of moral responsibility, and especially blame reluctant to accept these for themselves because it's psychologically easier to find someone else who might well be at least partially responsible and then attribute all the responsibility to that other person. So trying to convince an individual or a group that they are morally responsible for something in a backwards looking way is often simply going to fail. People have many tools at their disposal to resist those ascriptions, even when they shouldn't. But while many people try to dodge backward-looking moral responsibility, many people, sometimes the same ones, sometimes want to take forward-looking responsibility and actively seek out opportunities to do so. For one thing, I mean, taking on more responsibility often brings clear benefits. You can consider somebody who takes on more responsibilities at work in exchange for a higher salary or improved social status. Um, indeed, Mark Alfano suggests that our forward-looking moral responsibility practices originally arose to help us advance our cooperative social projects, and it still functions to make such cooperation possible and successful. But as he also notes, it isn't always instrumentalist reasoning or cost-benefit analysis that makes accepting future-oriented uh, responsibility appealing. Sometimes taking on more responsibility is considered intrinsically good. Indeed, it's a constitutive part of growing up. Consider all the young children who can't wait to be what, in the 80s, my friends and I simply called big kids. Uh, young kids learn by observing and emulating others, and many young kids are absolutely hungry for opportunities to take on the kinds of responsibilities that they observe older peers, siblings, and parents taking on. And while that yearning looks somewhat different as we age, I think that many, if not most of us, retain some measure of it. We want to be productive community members, 
to somehow contribute to the common good. These things give our lives meaning. So we also take on forward-looking responsibilities as constitutive parts of intrinsically valuable relationships with others in our lives. So this is why I wanna focus on the forward-looking kind of responsibility here. And to get us thinking about this forward-looking kind of responsibility, let's take note of some paradigm cases um, which include someone who voluntarily shoulders the duties of a key role in a cooperative endeavor. For instance, someone on a union's bargaining team, someone who rescues a dog who would otherwise be killed at a shelter, or someone who seeks out CPR training just in case somebody nearby ever needs it. An expectant parent who baby proofs their home, someone who starts a fitness regime in response to a health scare, or someone who takes it upon themselves to ensure that their friend has a ride to all their chemotherapy appointments, someone who sees a need in their neighborhood and just goes ahead and meets it, perhaps by shoveling the snow in front of an abandoned building, or someone who tries to at least partially right a wrong or repair a harm that they didn't cause, like people who voluntarily pick up trash along highways or who provide support for the families of citizens murdered by the police. I'm sure you can think of many other examples too, but there are enough here to start highlighting some of the differences between cases. Um, we've got examples of responsibility to a specified or unspecified individual or group responsibilities to oneself or to others, uh, responsibilities involving a one-off activity or ongoing activities, and examples that involve trying to right a wrong, prevent a harm, bring about a desirable outcome, or undertake what we might think of as an obligatory pursuit. The agents in these different examples are all acting intentionally but they may or may not be consciously thinking of what they're doing as taking responsibility. Their motivations can be really different and their motivating reasons may include moral, epistemic, aesthetic, practical, and political reasons. And the taking of responsibility might or might not be a response to their own or someone else's past failure um, of a sort that they're backwards looking responsible for. Now the agents in question also may or may not rise to the occasion and actually bring about the outcome or state of affairs that they're pursuing. Um, they may or may not successfully follow through with the forward looking responsibility that they've taken on. And when they fail, uh, they might or might not be culpable or otherwise backwards looking responsible. So much for differences. Now let's consider what the examples have in common. If we try to break them down, all the cases I've been thinking about seem to involve the following stages, though not necessarily in this order, and the stages can occur basically simultaneously. Uh, first, um, a person taking responsibility has to identify a possible future state that they think is both at least desirable, as with like the conscientious snow shoveler, and the pursuit of which might even seem in some sense necessary or obligatory, as with the expectant parent making preparations for their child. Um, and one must also think that the possible future state is realizable through an exercise of one's own agency with or without others collaboration. Now, uh, 1A on the slide is intentionally written in a pretty capacious way because there are many kinds of reasons that one might think the future state is desirable or obligatory or to be pursued. Um, and those reasons determine what kind of responsibility is being taken. Uh, for example, when our reasons for pursuing some imagined future state are moral reasons, 
that's when we're taking moral responsibility rather than or in addition to epistemic, legal, or some other type of responsibility. Sometimes we have reasons to take forward-looking moral responsibility that depend on our backward-looking responsibility. So for example, you might agree to serve on your union's bargaining committee because you haven't contributed your fair share of labor to the cause in the past and you think, oh, it's my turn. But at other times we have reasons to take forward-looking moral responsibility that are totally independent of any backward-looking kind of responsibility. For example, the, the person who rescues the dog from the shelter or gets proactively trained in CPR, that's not because of something that they did in the past that they need to somehow you know, make up for. And regardless of the reasons that one sees a possible future state as to be pursued via one's agency, um, the next stage in the process is intending or committing to bring about or at least to pursue that state and then planning for the actualization of the desired state. More specifically, this can involve trying to predict what will or could happen as you try to bring about that state, um, anticipating what you'll need to pursue your goal, confirming that you have or are taking steps to get what you'll need to pursue it. The necessary resources for pursuing that state might include knowledge of various kinds, skills, collaborators, material resources, or ways of altering the environment. And finally, um, you need to implement the plan, which might involve you know, dynamically readjusting in response to unexpected occurrences along the way. The details of how implementation works in different cases will, of course, vary immensely depending on what state you're aiming for and what resources you have for getting there. Now, obviously, there's a difference between actually taking responsibility and merely saying that you will. Um, we're all familiar with cases where someone says they will take responsibility for something, but they don't do all or maybe even any of the necessary steps. And once we set aside the cases where someone merely says they will take responsibility, we can divide the remaining cases into those in which the agent takes and successfully fulfills their responsibility and those in which the agent takes responsibility, probably in the sense of taking at least some necessary steps towards fulfilling it, um, but still somehow in the grand scheme, they, they fail to fulfill it for one reason or another. Okay. Now, what exactly is it that we take forward-looking responsibility for? We could, and often do, talk about taking responsibility for our actions. And this phrase can be used in forward-looking or backward-looking contexts. But to my mind, people tend to have an overly narrow conception of the word action when they talk about taking responsibility for actions. Many people seem to have in mind only the kinds of actions that involve bodily movements that can be observed by appropriately positioned third parties. Things like um, gestures, facial expressions, and verbalizations that sighted and hearing people located nearby can observe under normal conditions. But in contrast, I think we should be thinking of actions as expressions of agency. And many expressions of agency are cognitive or more broadly psychological actions. Huge numbers of our thoughts, feelings, doubts, decisions, desires, commitments, etc., are more or less direct reflections of our evaluative judgment. Many mental processes unfold and mental states come into existence because of our active, though not necessarily conscious, reasoning processes, and thus our agency. Granted, there are mental states that we cannot form by simply willing to do so, 
but I have good company in denying that that sort of voluntary control is what makes us morally responsible anyway. According to the rationalist kind of view that I favor, reason's responsiveness is what makes us morally responsible for something in the backwards looking sense. On Angie Smith's view, which is the foundation of mine, we're morally responsible for actions and attitudes when and because they are conceptually and rationally connected to our evaluative judgments, in principle subject to rational revision, and the basis for actual and potential moral assessments of people that we have good reasons to endorse. So for instance, someone uh, would be morally responsible for an uncontrolled verbal or mental outburst of racist or sexist invective when and because that outburst reflects their evaluative judgments not only when and because they voluntarily controlled or chose to have such an outburst. Someone can also be backwards looking morally responsible for mental and physical actions, even if they aren't aware of doing them, so long as those actions reflect their evaluative judgments and thus their rational agency. Um, my previous contribution to this literature is a pair of arguments that whether we understand concepts as mental representations or as abstract objects, the concepts that we possess and use can reflect our evaluative judgments in the same ways that our actions and attitudes can. Now, to build on that past work, I think we can not only be morally responsible in the backwards looking sense, but also take responsibility in the forward looking sense for far more than just our third person observable bodily movements. We can take moral responsibility for our attitudes and for the concepts that we possess and use as well. As noted previously, taking responsibility involves orienting oneself to the future, imagining an apparently desirable state that one might be able to bring about by exercising one's agency, forming an intention to realize that state, planning for its actualization, and implementing the plan. We can do all of these things with respect to the concepts in our repertoire. We can imagine worlds in which we have different concepts or use the ones that we have now very different. We can commit to creating such a world. We can plan to do so and fulfill our plans. Um, so to illustrate this, I'm going to break down and flesh out just the first stage of the responsibility taking process, adding some specificity to focus just on cases in which specifically moral responsibility is being taken, and it's specifically for possessing or using one or more concepts. The process begins with um, acknowledging some subset of the concepts that an individual or group presently possesses and uses, that is acknowledging that you or they have and use or could or would use that concept or those concepts, understanding to some degree the content of those concepts. Um, for philosophers, this might involve some rigorous you know, conceptual analysis, but in everyday contexts, people can gain the relevant understanding just from observing how they and others use the concepts in question. Um, we also identify something about that individual or shared conceptual repertoire that one has a moral reason to change. It might be that adding, revising, replacing, or eliminating a concept is necessary to avoid a potential wrong or harm. Um, or it might be just to bring about a moral good of some kind. And this goes hand in hand with apprehending a possible future state of an individual or shared conceptual repertoire that one thinks is not only morally desirable or obligatory to pursue, but that could be realized 
through an exercise of one's own agency with or without others' collaboration. The suggestion is not that one can simply will a new concept into or out of someone's repertoire. Rather, the point is that we can use our rational agency in ways that are likely to result in conceptual change. Such uses of rational agency might involve seeking out empirical information, critically evaluating arguments and evidence, communicating about reasons, or any of the other things that we do to educate ourselves and others. And the remaining stages of the responsibility taking process would remain the same, namely uh, committing to bring about the improvement, planning ahead for how to fulfill the commitment, and implementing the plan. Note that you might be taking responsibility for part of your own conceptual repertoire as an individual, or another individual's conceptual repertoire, or the repertoire shared by a group of which you may or may not be a member. This is kind of like how you can take responsibility for getting yourself or your kid or a whole group of people to school on time. And I take it that agents in real life have undertaken these steps, though they probably wouldn't describe themselves as taking responsibility for concepts. To return to my introductory example, when Carmita Wood, Lynn Farley, and their female colleagues had had enough of being groped at work and of women's bodies being the object of colleagues leering and lewd comments and had enough of their bosses not taking no for an answer, they decided that those workplace experiences did not fall under the concepts banter, flirting, or joking contra the common dogma of the time. And these women were able to imagine a future in which they had a concept and a term tailor-made to capture the specific wrongness of these ways in which so many people were being mistreated on the job. By using their rational agency and coming up with the concept of sexual harassment, they brought about a state of affairs in which people were much better positioned to think and communicate about and resist these forms of mistreatment. Their development and use of this new concept reflected their evaluative judgments about the moral wrongness of being sexually objectified on the job and the moral goodness of being empowered to resist such treatment. They didn't wait for someone else to give them the mental resources that they needed Instead, they took responsibility for their own understanding, not just because they valued understanding for its own sake, but also so they would be able to create positive change beyond their own minds, which they assuredly did. This case can help us see that taking responsibility for concepts won't always, or maybe even ever, be easy and we certainly won't always succeed when we try to do it. Um, for it may take a certain amount of practice with critical reflection to even become aware of the resources that we do and don't have for thinking. Plus, we're often mistaken about the content of our concepts and how and why we use them. This is something that's been il illuminated by Sally Haslinger. It requires significant imaginative powers and self-confidence to anticipate a possible future state in which one's own conceptual resources are somehow improved. It's much easier to just continue with the status quo. And it requires skilled communication and a certain amount of mutual trust to help someone else grasp a new concept or persuade them to make changes in how they use concepts. Plus, there are just so many pressing demands on our time, it's, it's hard to make room for a commitment to bringing about improvements to our conceptual resources. And since the future is murky, planning ahead to bring about a future in which our conceptual resources are improved um, is tricky. So each stage in the process of taking responsibility for concepts brings its own challenges. But conceptual engineering is tricky in strikingly similar ways. <laughs> in fact, um, when we reflect on the stages that I think are involved in taking forward-looking moral responsibility for concepts, 
They also look like the stages in the process of conceptual engineering. Whether we understand conceptual engineering to involve creating new concepts de novo or revising concepts um, or eliminating concepts from our repertoire or changing the ways in which people understand and use concepts, all of these activities fit the pattern that I've outlined. We do conceptual engineering because we're trying to bring about what we see as possible, desirable, and maybe even in some sense necessary future states of affairs. Specifically, conceptual engineering projects aim at trying to bring about states of affairs in which people's conceptual resources are improved in comparison to what we have now. These are future states in which people are thinking, communicating, and otherwise acting better, whether that means more accurately, more fairly, more generously, with more curiosity and more sympathy, or what have you. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes, conceptual engineers commit to pursuing these improved future states for moral reasons. Thus, I think we should categorize taking forward-looking moral responsibility for concepts as one kind of conceptual engineering. Now, some conceptual engineering projects aim to improve our resources on a grand scale, like when the engineered concepts are meant to be used by lots of regular people in everyday contexts, which generally takes significant time. But other projects aim for results that are more localized in time and space, like when the engineered concepts are meant to be used only by a select group of specialists. Uh, this slide um, maps out these two dimensions. I think the implementation challenges are somewhat greater when we seek uptake among the general population in everyday contexts, the cases that would be in the top half of this chart. Um, but those cases are also potentially more socially and morally transformative, and thus uh, the conceptual engineering projects that are most interesting to me personally. So um, because I gain a lot Personally, by digging into an example, in my remaining time, I want to talk about why and how I think we, self-described conceptual engineers and others, we should take forward-looking moral responsibility for one particular widely used non-specialist concept, uh, that of employment. As noted earlier, part of taking forward-looking moral responsibility for a concept is acknowledging where one's at in terms of the concepts one already does or doesn't possess and use. And when it comes to employment, I don't think it will be a struggle uh, for people to admit that they possess and use this one. Next, we need to try to understand the content of the target concept. For a rough first pass, we can say that employment is a contractual relationship in which an employer pays for the labor of an employee. As Elizabeth Anderson says, quote, in purchasing command over labor, employers purchase command over people. Now the word employment and its cognates are also used to refer to agents making use of tools for specific purposes, as in, she employed a box as a makeshift stool. While these two different ways of using these terms are certainly related, it's the contractual relationship between agents codified in our legal systems, not the use of inanimate objects that I'm concerned about here, um, but the fact that we use the same terms in both ways, that should give us pause. Um, providing a full or uncontroversial analysis of the concept employment is a task for another time, um, but I do want to note some key features of this concept that I hope will be pretty uncontroversial. So the concept of employment as a contractual relationship is familiar to a wide swath of people, including most of the adults and even many children that members of this audience are likely to encounter. It's so familiar because it's so very widely used, though its use, as depicted on this slide, 
has historically fluctuated in ways that would probably be very interesting to explore, but I can't do that here. Um, furthermore, the concept employment is a relational one that links a person or group of persons, an employer, to another person, an employee. And because people, not inanimate objects, are the ones who stand in the employment relationship, and because they form these relationships intentionally, we can also say that employment is a social concept. In fact, it's such an important social concept that it's really central to many people's self or other directed identity descriptions. Indeed, if asked to provide a biographical statement or to introduce themselves, lots of people in lots of contexts start with their employment before anything else. The distinctions between being employed and unemployed, employed by someone else versus self-employed, um, and employed by a particular firm or type of organization as opposed to another, all of these have immense social and material significance in the lives of lots of real people. Indeed, crucially, employment is also used and approved by our legal system. And while the specifics of laws differ across jurisdictions, every jurisdiction that I'm familiar with has some laws that specifically govern employment. In my opinion, the fact that employment is a relational, social, legally supported, identity relevant concept means that it has import in the moral domain. It can be expected to impact our thinking, feeling, and acting in important ways that might or might not stand up to moral scrutiny. And that's why I think we need to channel our inner Carmita Woods and Lynn Farley's and consider whether there are changes we could and should make to our conceptual repertoire regarding employment and related concepts. I think we can find both moral and epistemic reasons to commit to some sort of conceptual engineering of that sort. And to scrutinize the concept of employment, I'm going to draw on some fascinating work by David Ellerman. His book, Neo-Abolitionism, Abolishing Human Rentals in Favor of Workplace Democracy, draws on the ideas of numerous neglected historical thinkers and offers three different rights-based arguments against what you might think of as the employment system, insofar as you even think about it at all. His first argument is about contracts and inalienable rights. The second focuses on property rights and labor theory. And the third is about governance and democratic theory. Today, I'm just gonna focus on his first argument and it'll be enough for my purposes if you can just grasp its basic contours, even if you're not convinced by it. So here's a sketch of how it goes. Employment contracts stipulate that the responsible actions of the employee will be transferred to the employer in exchange for a wage or salary. Now, this argument is about contracts, not behaviors or feelings of individual bosses or workers. It's about the legal system in which, as Ellerman says, quote, employees bear no legal responsibility for the positive and negative results of their actions within the scope of their employment. The employer, bears all the legal responsibility, i.e. the employer legally owes for the negative results, the expenses, and legally owns the positive results, the revenues, end quote. He continues later saying, quote, all agency, responsibility, and decision-making are imputed to the person qua labor seller. The rented worker supposedly never decides to produce a widget, the seller of labor only decides to sell widget making labor. In this imaginative reconceptualization, it's only the employer who does anything like producing widgets. The employees are only responsible for deciding to sell the appropriate services, end quote. Those workers, quote, are legally treated, again, legally treated, simply as one of the expenses, the labor expense, incurred by the employer, end quote. 
Another way to put it is that, quote, employees are employed or rented as if they were instruments which serve as perfect conductors, transmitting their responsibility back to the employer. However, the unique property of labor, namely responsible agency, is not factually transferred or transferable. As Ellerman says, quote, we can only agree to cooperate with others. We cannot transfer or alienate the de facto control over our voluntary actions, end quote. So man hours are unlike van hours. Quote, an employee cannot give up and transfer the use of his own person as the van owner can give up and transfer the use of his own van. The worker remains a fully responsible agent, knowingly cooperating with the entrepreneur. The employee and the employer share the de facto responsibility for the results of their joint activity. But as he says later, quote, voluntarily becoming a de facto non-person or a thing to fulfill such a contract is not factually possible for autonomous rational choosers. Thus, um, despite assertions to the contrary, the contract to legally transfer labor is never <clears throat> fulfilled by the de facto transfer of labor. Or, quote, persons cannot factually alienate their responsible agency. So an alternative factual performance is accepted by the legal system as fulfilling the contract, namely obeying the employer. When the person's voluntary obedience has thus fulfilled the contract, then the legal authorities enforce the legal consequences as if the person had voluntarily become of diminished or no capacity, end quote. The key normative premise is that, quote, the legal system should not accept as being legally valid and enforceable any contract that is essentially a legalized fraud, e.g. that pretends to alienate some aspect of personhood that cannot, in fact, be voluntarily alienated. As Ellerman reiterates, quote, in general, any contract to take on the full-time or part-time legal role of a thing or a non-person is inherently invalid because a person cannot, in fact, voluntarily give up and alienate their factual status as a person, end quote. To accept such contracts is to institutionalize injustice. For when the legal system denies workers de facto responsibility, that's an injustice akin to a false negative, a type one injustice. And when the legal system imputes agency to employers that hasn't been transferred from workers because it can't be, that's an injustice akin to a false positive, a type two injustice. Therefore, the legal system should not accept employment contracts as valid and enforceable. Instead, quote, the alternative to employment is workplace democracy, the system where people are always jointly working for themselves, paying their own costs, self-governing their own work, and owning whatever they produce, end quote. For while the transfer or alienation of responsible agency is not possible, the delegation of responsible agency is possible. Now, using this and other lines of reasoning, Ellerman argues that the employment system is more accurately conceptualized as the human rental system, and that it should be replaced by a system of workplace democracy. I find this and his other arguments pretty persuasive, uh, though I'm not going to defend them just now. Instead, without making any claims about the overall weight of reasons, but taking seriously the critical questions that arise when reflecting on work, I'll note that Ellerman gives us epistemic reasons to reject both common capitalist and socialist ways of thinking, which also function as reasons to change our legal systems. I want to use his work as a jumping off place to explore the moral reasons we have to change our conceptual repertoires, both the sets of concepts we have and the ways we use them. Here are some reasons to consider. 
when we apply the concept employee to a person, whether to ourselves or someone else, we normalize and reinforce the erasure of that person's agency in the context of their workplace, which is profoundly disrespectful to that person. Not only that, but insofar as conceptualizing people as employees eliminates, reduces, or obscures their agency in the workplace, that way of thinking seems to constitute a hermeneutical injustice to those workers. Similarly, when we apply the concept employer to someone, we disguise the fact that they have initiated an inherently fraudulent contract, one which demands of another something that is in fact impossible, which in effect prioritizes obedience over collaboration among equals, and which benefits the so-called employer by licensing them to inaccurately claim that another's productive agency is their own. Using a concept that masks the disrespect, deception, and fraud involved in a contractual relationship would seem to both enable and compound the wrongness of initiating and enforcing such a contract. Conceptualizing people as employers, or as many Americans do as job creators, um, this hides key features of what they're doing and thus lets them off the hook. It allows them and us to maintain an illusion. Insofar as the concept employment conceals key aspects of existing relationships, continuing to use it in familiar ways enables the perpetuation of various harms. While Ellerman's arguments about institutional inconsistency don't depend on any claims about harm, I think it's clear that the status quo is harmful and that the harms are morally relevant. As long as we continue thinking about existing contractual relationships in the ways that are currently familiar, we'll continue denying workers all sorts of opportunities to exercise their rational agency and opportunities to have an equal say in how we structure our shared world and operate within it. Furthermore, um, by codifying the use of the concept employment in our legal system, we use the full force of the law to distort the epistemic landscape in which citizens operate by erasing workers' agency and we thereby both license and enforce the maintenance of unequal power relations. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna discuss any ways in which the related concepts self-employment and unemployment seem morally problematic, but I think there's a lot to be said about those concepts, and we can explore that in the Q&A if people are interested. Now, in contrast, human rentals is less deceptive. This less familiar, less widely used concept can sort of jolt us out of complacency and thus help us accurately represent the contractual relationships that exist between paid workers and the entities that pay them. That said, I bet that basically no one wants to think of themselves as a rentable commodity. Our aversion to conceptualizing our conceptualizing ourselves and our loved ones as rentable commodities is evidence that we find it objectifying and disrespectful to be thought of and otherwise treated as such. Nor would most people who fancy themselves egalitarians want to think of themselves as someone who does the renting of fellow humans. Now, despite these aversions, there can be reasons um, beyond just a desire for accuracy to conceptualize oneself as a rented human. For instance, one might do that as a sort of coping mechanism. And here, uh, a possibly unflattering story might help. During part of the pandemic, when I was dealing with some really messed up working conditions at the university where I worked at the time, I regularly said, I work for Walmart in my head and out loud. It was my shorthand, very imperfect way of acknowledging the structural similarities that are common across workers' experiences. Similarities that people in so-called professional jobs, especially in the nonprofit and public sectors, 
are often able to fool themselves into ignoring. By ceasing to ignore how workers are treated in law and in practice as interchangeable commodities to benefit our so-called superiors, I was able to make better sense of what I was going through, and that improved my mental health. And others in much worse and maybe even in better working conditions might sometimes similarly benefit from a direct acknowledgement of their status as a rented human, whether they literally or only figuratively work for Walmart. And aside from the personal level psychological benefits we might get from conceptualizing ourselves and others as rented humans and renters of humans, there might also be social and political benefits to be gained. For one thing, doing so highlights the opposed interests of the ones being rented and the ones doing the renting in a way that might help with workers' solidarity in general, and especially in contexts involving unions. It could also be, also be a useful practice for those seeking to improve labor laws. Currently, at least in the US, so-called employers or job creators are generally understood as providing an absolutely vital public service, one so essential that many legislators bend over backwards to prioritize their interests at every turn. However, when you understand people in firms not as job creators or even employers, but rather as entities that rent human beings, it's much harder to maintain the fiction that their role in society is a wholly good one that legislation should always protect, one to which there are no decent alternatives. Insofar as human rentals is a less deceptive concept when applied to existing relationships, and insofar as greater honesty is both intrinsically good and can bring about knock-on benefits, we have some moral reason to give human rentals a more prominent place in our conceptual repertoire. Insofar as thinking of existing relationships as involving human rentals forces us to confront the sorts of disrespect, fraud, and injustice built into the so-called employment system, the concept can be a useful resource for thinking our way toward a morally better future. That's a partial answer to why we should, morally speaking, bring our conceptual engineering skills to bear regarding employment and related concepts. Uh, now to wrap up, I'll say a little bit about the how question. What would it look like to take moral responsibility for the flawed concept of employment in our shared conceptual repertoire? I've suggested that replacing employment with human rentals is one way to go, but alternatively, maybe we should keep applying the same concepts in the same context that we're familiar with, but with an un adjusted understanding of their content. To decide between these and other options, note that successful engineering in general and successfully taking responsibility in general, both require having a fairly concrete notion of what it is that we're pursuing. So we need to determine what exactly we should be aiming to achieve via our conceptual engineering. But since I don't have all the answers here, I'll just comment on process rather than advocate for one specific outcome. Um, here are some general habits that we have reason to cultivate. Being open to changing whether and how we use those concepts, especially in public institutional and legal settings, and of course, educational contexts. Devoting more time to thinking critically and debating about them, drawing attention to whether, when, and how people, ourselves included, use or don't use those concepts, listening to what others have to say about them, and really taking seriously the ideas of others, especially others whose experiences are different from our own. Regarding the concept employment in particular, here are some more concrete ideas. We can learn about and discuss workplace democracy, and I would strongly suggest doing so collaboratively, not just on one's own. We can individually and collectively um, support worker-led, cooperatively run businesses or start them. We can participate in uni unionization or collective bargaining processes to build skills and coalitions and structures that recognize workers' agency. And we can use the language of employment and its alternatives very intentionally. There's a lot more to be said here. Um, obviously, but I want to leave the rest of our time for Q&A.
I really look forward to the discussion. Um, thank you all.